Good day to everyone where I, wherever you are around the world. Uh, my name is George Fenton. I'm the chairman and chief executive of the Humanitarian Logistics Association. Uh, I'm talking to you today from England and it's great to be with you. I'm very honored to be um, opening together with uh, Dr. Luke van Lassenhoff um, from INSEAD uh, this session on day two of the Health and Humanitarian Logistics Conference 2020. So uh, we are tasked today with um, giving you a, a, a brief uh, recap of uh, yesterday's session. And so I'm happy to, to start with that. And then Luke and I are just gonna reflect perhaps on some of the history of uh, humanitarian logistics. Yesterday, uh, Professor Pinar Kekokiak, I, sorry, I mispronounced your name, Pinar, and uh, uh, Julie Swan opened with the, the objectives of the conference being to increase agility and re resilience of health supply chains, facilitate dialogue among actors and key stakeholders, and of course, bring communities together. And this is a great way to bring communities together uh, from so many different places, uh, given that we're having to do this all virtually. So um, I hope that you enjoy today's uh, sessions. Uh, what we want to be able to do is support practitioners, uh, NGOs, foundations, government officials, uh, people from the private sector, as well as, of course, academics. Um, and so we hope to, to do that through various sessions, uh, posters, uh, uh, networking opportunities, of course, uh, workshops, and a, uh, a panel session later on today. Uh, Dr. Swan also said that as a participant, we should think about what new knowledge we acquire, how we transform that knowledge into act and action, and how we can influence and nudge others into action. So, uh, and one way of doing that was through the keynote presentation uh, that was made by Ed Martinez from the UPS Foundation. Uh, that session was moderated by Michelle Nunn, who was the uh, president from and CEO from uh, Care USA. Um, and Ed Martinez was talking about uh, the importance of vaccinating billions of, of people uh, given the COVID crisis. Uh, that massive challenge is, is uh, coming down the track. So supply chain, of course, is going to be, um, and all of the people involved in managing supply chains is going to be a, a big task ahead. Uh, preparedness um, is key for all the crises that um, uh, you know, we're facing over the next decade. And, and that means strengthening public health systems and working with local communities. Uh, particularly, uh, Mr. Martinez was saying, where women carry the heaviest load. And he was also saying that partnerships and trust are essential and they need to be established before as any part of preparedness. There are a number of other things that we learned such as um, allowing uh, the sort of prevention and early detection uh, in effective uh, rapid response and uh, many other aspects around health and humanitarian logistics, which is much more coming together as, as a cohesive capability, um, particularly we've seen over the last few years, uh, a real uh, series of developments in that area. Okay, so we have um, a good mix of people, uh, quite a lot of people from uh, academia, a good uh, group of uh, people from the NGO sector and private sector, as well as others. I'd like to take this opportunity as well to uh, introduce the a fellow uh, association, the International Association of Public Health Logisticians, who partners with uh, the HLA uh, to support practitioners in the health and humanitarian logistics space. We have a shared vision to improve supply chains and make sure that aid reaches those in need faster and more efficiently. Um, and we want to see a dramatic improvement in aid supply chains moving forward. And that's going to be through coordination and collaboration, better connections. I just wanted to take a few minutes to reflect on 
where we came from in, in humanitarian logistics. And I, we've got a little poll here to, uh, to get you thinking. It would be good to get the responses from, from this. Where do you guys think uh, humanitarian logistics or the term humanitarian logistics first was used? Okay, so yeah, I see many people think early 2000s. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to pin it down exactly, but I guess it was around that time. I, I think that probably the, the time that it was really starting to be, be recognized as an important function was after the Asian tsunami in uh, 2004. So 2005, probably, I would say. But I don't know, Luke, whether you have any reflections on that. Thank you, George. So how are you all doing today? I mean, I, I said that to George earlier today, but he didn't understand me coming from the UK, but I guess most of the American participants will understand when I use the term y'all. Uh, and you're asking something to an old man, uh, George. I mean, when did the term humanitarian logistics start? I started in 2000, I know that, because I was, I was called, by coincidence, by Bernard Chomelier from the Red Cross in Geneva. Uh, to ask me to, if I could help him with his idea of, of redesigning the supply chain and, and introducing pre-positioning hubs. You know, that was actually, for me, the start. And I think that um, 2001, 2002, I think we had a couple of meetings. Uh, and and in the, at that time, uh, Fritz Institute, which wasn't really called the Fritz Institute yet, but uh, Lynn Fritz, was, um, was trying to do, uh, bring together a number of stakeholders and, and start working on logistics and supply chain management in the humanitarian sector. And so the, I think those were the origins, but you're right, um, up until 2005, 2006, um, I mean, maybe there was some competence being built up in terms of logistics and supply chains in the humanitarian organizations, but it was certainly not appreciated or valued uh, by the rest of the organization. And so that was something that came with the tsunami and all the issues involved in that. Uh, you know, the organizations finally said, we need to do something about this and build serious capabilities in supply chain management. So yeah, I think that's, that's, pretty, much, um, that's pretty much it. But you know, I wouldn't be able to pin it down. Yeah, difficult one, but... Um... It's great that uh, I think we've made a lot of progress over the last couple of decades to, to move things forward and gain recognition uh, within organizations, particularly within aid sector organizations, around the importance of uh, good supply chain management and effective linkages to the way that we provide um, interventions, assistance uh, in different yeah. contexts. Um, well, something that came up... George, something that came up yesterday a lot and, and which I really uh, welcome is that people are, are looking a lot more at, at local communities and, and, and health or basic needs of the local communities, whether it's in normal circumstances, we call them normal, uh, or in, in disaster circumstances. And, uh, you know, thinking a lot more about how, how we do the last mile and, uh, and, and, you know, less of the of the old system of let's just push everything down there, but a lot more about what do the people need and can we react to that a lot better. So the pool, the more pool type systems, beneficiary centric systems based on local community needs and so on and, and, and local capacity building, I think is 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 a very nice trend to see, although it's a long and winding road to get there. I guess. Yeah, it certainly is, uh, Luke. I very much agree. Um, so I think what we're going to do now is just move on to thank our sponsors for this event, uh, UPS Foundation and Chemonix, uh, without which uh, uh, we wouldn't be able to put on the, the conference uh, over these, these uh, few days. So thank you very much to, to the sponsors. And I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide. Uh, have very, very honored uh, to welcome to the conference, Dr. Esperanza Martinez, who is the head of health uh, for the International Committee of the Red Cross 
Um, Dr. Martinez is responsible for overseeing the delivery of humanitarian health services to populations affected by war and violence in more than 80 countries around the world. Uh, she's a medical doctor and general surgeon and has worked in many conflict affected countries as well as with UN agencies and governments and the private sector. So Dr. Martinez, we're very honored to have you with us today. And uh, I'd like to turn over the uh, presentation to you to make your address. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, George, for the introduction. And I will go ahead uh, as there seems to be a glitch with the video. Um, so I basically um, was asked to talk about adapting the delivery of humanitarian assistance and, the con uh, and, and health activities, which is my field of operations, both to the conflict situation and to uh, COVID-19. So really this double. Um, okay, thank you very much, George, for the introduction. And I will go ahead uh, as there seems to be a glitch with the video. Um, so I basically um, was asked to talk about adapting the delivery of humanitarian assistance and, the con uh, and, and health activities, which is my field of operations, both to the conflict situation and to uh, COVID-19. So really this double um, uh, issue that we have in armed conflict. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to discuss these is issues with you. And, uh, and really to offer the humanitarian perspective here uh, from, a, from an agency uh, that basically is mandated to work in armed conflict and situations of violence. So the International Committee of the Red Cross, as many of you know, is mandated by the Geneva Conventions to assist and protect vic victims of armed conflict. And uh, when you look at our mandate, you might think that is very narrow. You say, well, they might not be too busy. But actually, when we look at the statistics today, there are more than 100 armed conflicts taking place today, involving more than 60 states and more than 100 non-state armed groups. So when we look at the state of the world today, actually we do have a significant amount of work, not only us, but many other humanitarian agencies that work in armed conflict and, and with populations that are affected by violence. As a humanitarian organization, we deliver services and goods that really are, ess are essential for the survival of millions of people and communities in more than 80 countries. And in many contexts, because of the protracted nature of this crisis, uh, we have been present for decades. So we are looking at countries, countries like Afghanistan, Somalia, Gaza, Colombia, in this context, we have been present for more, more than 30 years and in several others as well. And when we look at the connection between what the ICRC does and humanitarian logistics and health logistics, but humanitarian overall, many of the activities that we carried out are closely linked to that. So for example, we do um, a, a interventions in health, uh, water and sanitation, infrastructure, and economic security. And these areas are very much linked to procurement, storage, transport, and delivery, both of goods and services. And they have to be compliant with quite a stringent uh, international norms and standards. When we look at the economic security interventions, for example, we look at food security. Uh, and we look at uh, livestock and agricultural support, and they are heavily dependent on the transport and the procurement of food and the distribution of food. When we look at health and our primary healthcare programs, you, you are lo looking at medicine, the transport and storage and delivery of medicine and vaccines, uh, particularly for maternal and child health interventions. So this, this element of humanitarian logistics is closely associated to what we do overall in the humanitarian sector. But looking at the, the role of the ICRC and our work, I would say in normal times, and I'm putting normal in brackets, we already manage a number of constraints that are associated to the environment where we work. Um, for example, and we will, uh, let me just quickly, I'm sorry to see, starting my video. Um, so in many of the contexts where we work, um, wars have destroyed or have damaged vital infrastructure. For example, ports, 
airports, roads, bridges, and warehouses are generally affected. If we look at one example only, in Yemen, the mobilization of commercial goods was really affected when we have all the volatility around the Hodeida port in 2018-2019. And at that time, when we look at how many, what percentage of goods were entering the country, less than 50% of essential supplies, including food and medicines, were entering the country. And today, many of the airports have restricted flights uh, in terms of commercial mobilization of goods, and it's only allowing the entry of humanitarian assistance. So this is, it is an element, is not only the damage of infrastructure, but also that some of the necessary infrastructure from a logistical point of view, it's restricted in terms of the use. Key services, for example, electricity and water, are also often lacking or restricted only to the large cities and capitals. And this poses a challenge for humanitarian interventions. In terms of water, if we look at clean water supply as an essential uh, good, water as an essential good that needs to be delivered to manage outbreaks of diarrheal diseases, for example. Or if we look at water as an essential component of the water and sanitation interventions in the, in the early stages of containment of COVID-19, that is a luxury in many of the places where we work. Now, when we look at electricity, uh, electricity is basically one of the components in health that is extremely important for the preservation of cold chains and the mobilization of vaccines. Electricity as well is necessary to operate, to run operating theaters and to manage the wounded coming from the battlefields. So in armed conflict, you don't begin to plan your uh, humanitarian operation by thinking about what you are going to do, that is the how you are going to do it. So how am I going to get the water that I need in my project? How am I going to power the equipment that we are going to deliver? And that, those things are like easy questions, but if we look at the remote area of Afghanistan or a remote area of South Sudan, those are major, major hurdles because you need to move all the goods that you require, even basic construction equipment and supplies like bricks, sand, fuel, generators. All of those need to be transported and very often they need to be transported by air with all the different challenges that that presents. So besides the infrastructure and the, and the vital uh, um, services that are lacking or damaged, the, uh, another aspect that needs to be considered in uh, a humanitarian context affected by war is access and security. And I think, George, you mentioned already that it's been discussed here, the fact that negotiation for access is a key part of what we do. We need to negotiate access with the different actors uh, involved in a fighting or in a given conflict. Many of them with very radical point of views in relation to what you do and to humanitarian delivery. Access also needs to be negotiated and accepted by community. So the, the humanitarian interventions need to be discussed with communities. So there is a buy-in element built from the beginning. So communities are aware of what you are delivering are, and, and are also engaged in the process of, of allowing the humanitarian action to take place. However, when we look at um, armed conflict set, settings affected by warm and armed, armed conflict, they are extremely impoverished. The economic hardship that is affecting communities is significant. And therefore, security of goods becomes a problem. So not only the transport of goods and transport of commodities, but the storage of commodities. So the securing of warehouses and the goods that you have uh, procured and have entered into the country or into the given context for delivery for a humanitarian operation becomes a top priority. Last but not least, there are humanitarian exemptions for the movement of goods, but still there are many humanitarian settings today where import is severely restricted either by national law or by international sanctions. And then when we are faced with a spike of violence in this context, or would you have a sudden onset emergency, the fact that you have these significant barriers in terms of import becomes a problem in terms of the humanitarian delivery. 
Just one example is in the height of the Mosul battle, there were severe restrictions to import certain medications and certain medical supplies into Iraq, and it took months of negotiation to uh, overcome those barriers. Other contexts that today have uh, a number of restrictions imposed on them are Syria, Iran, Libya, Venezuela, and many other, other human, humanitarian contexts that we operate today. So besides these factors, which are, I would say, the day-to-day -day factors that we as an organization need to manage, then what else happens with COVID? So that's the question. What, what different happened uh, with the pandemic that we are managing? And what are the challenges and the opportunities that we have observed? And the first and the most obvious one has been the impact on manufacturing capacity. So the fact that personal protection equipment was largely manufactured in China and India, and that many factories closed down as part of the containment measures at the beginning of the pandemic, meant that the global demand exceeded the uh, global of, of the offer at that, at that stage. So in the, first month, in the first months, basically we did have a discrepancy between what was produced and what was demanded and required. And many of us have seen the news and uh, have been exposed from very early on to the news, and many of them really heartbreaking about the lack of personal protection equipment in hospitals and health facilities across the world. So this is not only in humanitarian settings, it's really affecting many of the, of the countries where we live or where we operate. Once items started to be produced in a large scale, the key challenge faced, and that is still unresolved, is the lack of streamlined standards that are universally accepted for some items. For example, just one example only, when we look at masks, FFP2 or N95 masks, then we have the European standards and we have the American standards. That means that if we were going to purchase in China N92 masks with European standards, we could not deliver them in context that only accepted American standards or vice versa. And this created a major holder in terms of the logistics and the dispatch of the different um, items that were badly needed, but they were not accepted by ministries of health and by states because they were not compliant with the standards they have in their, in their, um, in their list. Now, in our case, we managed to correct that because of the bulk of orders that we, that, we, uh, that we put in place and also by collaborating with other organizations. We um, coordinated our deliveries and coordinate uh, with organizations like METS and Sun Frontiers, and that allows us flexibility to manage this. However, when we look at the smaller organizations, they might not have the capacity to manage these kind of hurdles when you have discrepancy in terms of the, of the standards that different countries are accepting. So that's, that's the first one. So the manufacturing capacity that has been resolved uh, as we move forward in the pandemic, but then this lack of streamlined standards for many items remains an issue. The second one was the imposition of export restrictions in some countries. Um, and many countries, in an effort to protect their own capacity to respond, basically uh, impose restrictions on what they exported. This was not only on PPE. This was also, also affecting, for example, some pharmaceutical. Paracetamol was a clear example where India, uh, as, uh, as one of the countries that restricted the export of paracetamol. And that was one of the key elements of the response uh, for people affected with COVID. So this, uh, in our understanding, this issue has been discussed at the World Trade Organization here in Geneva, because it severely affected countries that didn't have stocks, PPE stocks, and didn't have production capacity very early in the pandemic. From a humanitarian perspective, we think that certain volume of goods should be packed uh, for humanitarian purposes and for humanitarian use. However, this is not imposed or is at the moment not compulsory, even though there are discussions and states uh, are in general a, a supportive of humanitarian action. There are no volumes of goods that are tagged for humanitarian purposes. Finally, um, there was the impact on travel, the impact on travel availability and cost of traveling. So from March to July 2020, 
there was reduce uh, of transport availability, which led to an escalation of prices, in some cases up to 300%, both of goods and people. And with people rather, almost we couldn't move people, but of goods up to 300%. Now, the prices are decreasing, but we are still in average observe uh, uh, a, a spike uh, in, um, or a comparative increase of prices of up to 25% if we compare with pre-COVID um, cost. Regarding international road transport, uh, the main issue is related to the quarantine of drivers once they cross borders. And we do have in Africa, several countries that were drivers have to be quarantined between one country and the other. And of course that affects all the logistics of road transportation um, and humanitarian logistics as well. Maritime uh, transport was at the beginning heavily impacted because of the lack of movement of personnel. So many of the crews were uh, finding themselves unable to rotate and do the shifts necessary because they couldn't transport the people or the people needed to be quarantined. So the crews were quarantined. The restrictions of movement of people also not only impacted this uh, reno re renewal of crews, air transport and maritime transport crews, but also several airports were closed and warehouses could not be manned properly. So at several different levels, we saw that this restriction in the movement of people also affected the supply chain. If we look at the future, and if we imagine a future where there will be a, a vaccine, an effective and safe and affordable vaccine, the issue is going to be an issue of a scale. And one of the biggest hurdles that we see is the transport capacity, particularly air travel and warehousing capacity, cold warehousing capacity. And we are, and this, this scenario is only considering an, uh, a scenario in which we need regular cold chains to maintain a vaccine of this nature. And, and you probably are aware that IATA, a few weeks back, already announced that in Africa, maintaining a cold chain and having enough cold warehousing at airport level to manage the volume of vaccines required is simply impossible. It is, there is no capacity to do that. So those are, um, I really regret that I cannot see you, that you cannot see me, but I just wanted to say that as an organization that works in armed conflict, we do have these challenges related to our normal operations in armed conflict that have been compounded by COVID. And at the end of the day, when we look at the future and how can this be overcome, I think you already in day one, and today you will be discussing more of this, is really a call to put resources together, to collaborate and to coordinate either to collaborate and put resources and logistic capacity together in a given context, or make sure that our efforts are complementary. And when I say our efforts, I'm talking about humanitarian agencies, the private sector, and states, ministries of health and other ministries involved in uh, authorization of import, export, and all the logistics, different logistic uh, pieces that need to be put into place. So that's, that's the only way of moving forward. We have today humanitarian logistics and health logistics are already complex. They were already uh, beyond the remit of a single organization. But if we look at what COVID has brought in addition, it basically only, there is only one way forward, which is this pooling, coordination and collaboration of resources in the, in the near future. So George, back to you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really um, available for questions um, if there are any or for further comments. Thank you very much, uh, Esperanza. Very interesting and very pertinent. And yes, fully agree that there needs to be much better collaboration, coordination as we move forward in these difficult times. Uh, I wanted though to um, go back and uh, ask you a question regarding uh, the challenges of working in conflict, of course, because that is one of the other major challenges and sort of in many instances, um, some of the key and, and uh, huge crises that are occurring are in conflict zones and uh, are what we call uh, forgotten emergencies. Um, 
And many of those are occurring with less respect to international humanitarian law. Do you think that those factors are changing the nature of humanitarian health worker particularly and the type of skills that people need to do their jobs? And we are, George, we are referring here to a broader um, humanitarian workforce. We are not focusing only on the logistics one. Is that your question? Yes. I mean, obviously, we, in this case, we have a, a bias towards logistics, but this is broader, of course. Yes, 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 you are biased. But I think you have discussed this probably on day one, and I heard you mentioning that at the beginning. Um, we all need to be negotiators when we, talk, we, we are in armed conflict. Um, in the sense that we need to be able to, to ensure that there is a clear understanding of what we are doing on the ground. And today, so the element of dialogue and engagement with communities is extremely important. Um, we also need to make sure that we involve the different elements of, of society. One of the things we did very early on, um, particularly for in relation to COVID awareness in the Sahel, is the ICRC convened a meeting of uh, Muslim scholars to discuss how the COVID um, scientific data emanating was linked to Muslim teaching. And that led to a series of fatwas in which basically that they were compatible with, with Muslim teaching. So that they were, as they were translated into language that the community accepted and they were basically compatible with the religious belief. But we couldn't, as a non-humanitarian organization, do that job ourselves. That was done with engagement with the Muslim scholars who themselves basically made the translation and what it meant for the communities. So that kind of exercise needs to be done, not only with uh, academics and scholars in the different lines of thought, but, and, and also from a religious angle, but they are also need to be done particularly with communities and community leaders, ensuring that we also involve women and women leaders at community level. Because very often the gatekeepers at community level are men, and therefore we might risk leaving women and children behind in our, in our thinking. So we need to have this kind of, of thinking that we need to negotiate our presence. We need to ensure that it is understood and that what we are going to do is accepted by the communities themselves. From the ICRC, um, as you know, we are an organization that not, doesn't only deliver assistance, but we also have a, a protection mandate. So really looking at how can we basically engage with communities in a way that they are less exposed to risk and they are less exposed to violations and, and infringement on their rights and their safety and their dignity. And in that sense, we, we, we take a very uh, people-centric approach in the sense of looking at what their needs are from their perspective and discussing with them what the most optimal solutions are. That's not a luxury that all organizations have because some um, NGOs do have a very prescriptive uh, program that they need to deliver. They are funded for a specific program. And even when they are on the ground and they identify a different need, they are bound by that specific funding. So that, that also restricts somehow the ability of some organizations to negotiate this environment. But it's also talking to communities. It's just one of the things we, we need to remember is that we don't deliver humanitarian aid to community, we don't do humanitarian action to the communities and for the communities. We need to do it with the communities that we serve. So that will go a long way. Over to you, George. Yes, thanks, Esperanza. No, very, very good points. I'm just uh, now looking at some of the questions that we're receiving on the Q&A. And um, if anybody would like to ask the question uh, verbally, please raise your hand. Um, the first question I have is from uh, uh, Telesila Kotsi. I don't know whether Telesila, you want to ask your question verbally or, or uh, I can read it out. Uh, sure, I tried to open my video, but can you listen to me? Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, please go ahead. 
Okay, yeah. great. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for moderating the session, and thank you, Esperanza, for uh, all the insights uh, about the dual challenges that now organizations face when they respond both to COVID and the armed conflicts. I was wondering about the armed conflicts environment. How, if you can give us some more examples, how does it change your distribution channels, for example, or in general, your logistics, the storage decisions you take, or the transportation, or what kind of assets you're using in comparison to when there is a natural disaster? Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the question, Telesila. And there are different adaptations that we have to undertake. Uh, the first one is that we do have quite a solid uh, security uh, mapping where we operate. Uh, we cannot, for example, organize a food delivery unless we have, first of all, negotiated uh, access. So really discuss with the different factions and the different groups to make sure that our staff and the people that are going to access the, the, the food distribution point are safe. This has changed over the years. Before we used to have conflicts that there were one state and one guerrilla group, for example, or one rebel group. So there were two groups that you needed to negotiate with an army and with one guerrilla commander. Today, those times are almost gone and you have so many different factions and so many different segments of the, of the, um, in, in the fighting groups that you need to do multiple negotiations um, and you need to activate your network of contacts with the community as well as they know um, who the different factions are. So the negotiation part is, is one of the things that is a prerequisite. We don't uh, um, generally, as ICSC, um, deliver humanitarian action unless it's negotiated. So it's really the access. The other thing we negotiate uh, um, is the neutrality of what we do. So very often, and this is linked to the question that also Lila posed, is often there is an enormous pressure on, pressure on humanitarian actors to deliver to one side of the conflict and not to the other. And say, oh, yes, you can go, but you can only deliver to this group. You cannot deliver to the other group. And we operate on the principle of neutrality and independence, and particularly on the principle of neutrality. It's basically that humanitarian aid is delivered based on needs, uh, no distinction of who is fighting whom, or affiliation in relation to religion, or in relation to culture, uh, clans, and so on. And that, again, requires quite a lot of negotiation. Unfortunately, one of the things that happens in armed conflict is that very often access through roads and to uh, normal means of transport could be severely restricted, either because there are roadblocks or because there is active fighting or because there is looting. And therefore, one of the adaptations is switch to air transport, and we do quite a significant volume of air transport as well, and that has the, the immediate consequence of that is that we are able to deliver uh, neither humanitarian aid, but the cost increases enormously. And this is not only happening to the ICRC, this happens as well to the Mets and Sun Frontiers, to the UN and so on. So when we deliver uh, humanitarian aid in an environment which is more challenging, there are associated costs on the logistics side that need to be absorbed and, and need to be counted um, within, the, within the planning. And back to you, George. And I hope, Telecilia, that I answered uh, the question. Thanks very much, Esperanza. And uh, another question I'll read out here from um, Bengisu. Um, he says, uh, uh, could you please comment on how you address unique equity challenges in an armed conflict situation? Example is, I recently read an article which states that the aid gets stolen by certain groups. Then on paper, Beneficiary group A might seem as if they received the aid, but actually they did not. The aid was stolen and given to, to beneficiary group B. Mm -hmm. there, is, uh, there is the element, again, we go back to humanitarian principles. Is uh, really the, the fact that as a humanitarian organization and to be able to operate in, in very, very uh, heavy and, and difficult environments, we need to make sure that there is an understanding of what we do. And that there is an understanding that as an organization, we don't carry a religious agenda, a cultural agenda, a political agenda. When you do have that understanding, and that, George, come back, comes back to your point first 
what do we need to do today as humanitarian actors? We need to make sure that there is an understanding that in this and this context, in this very uh, a fragile context and volatile context, that there is an understanding that humanitarian aid is neutral, independent humanitarian action. If we manage to do that, then we already have gained a territory to be able to negotiate that the distribution of aid is based on needs and is not based on um, the determination of different groups, based on different factors that play at local level. It happens uh, that, uh, that aid is stolen or aid is, uh, or warehouses are raided. So that's one of the points I raised before. What we need, we do quite significantly, uh, a large volume of our work in logistics is make sure that we do have a logistics setup which is secure, which basically allows us to deliver the goods where they need to be delivered and that they are not diverted along the way. We, as ICRC, we don't use armed escorts uh, in general in our operations. So we rely really on discussing and obtaining approvals to be able to move the goods. Uh, but at the end of the day, then what happens at ground level, it needs to be, I come back to the same point, George and, and everyone else, is negotiation, is really discussing. And not negotiation in terms of, I do this for you, and you do this for me, is not saying, look, there are obligations under international humanitarian law that protect those communities and those who are not fighting. And they do have the right to help, they do have the right to food, and they do basically have a, a series of elements that need to be in place for their survival. And, uh, and there is always, you always find a point of connection because uh, the fighters themselves, they do have families. They do belong to communities. They do belong to groups. So there is always an element where you can connect if you know the community you are working with, if you know the environment. So the, no, the knowledge of the environment is extremely critical when you work in conflict to make sure that you are able to deliver, but also to make sure that you don't get killed or get kidnapped in the, in the middle of your humanitarian operation. Yeah, thank you, Esperanza. Uh, now we have another question, I think, uh, from Lotha, who was happy to answer, uh, to ask that question uh, in, in person. Uh, Lotha, are you there? Are you connected? Yes, I, I hope you can also hear me now. Yes. Perfect, cool. Hi, hi from Germany. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for, for the insight already. Something I, I was thinking about uh, after yesterday's meeting already is um, what, what are the lessons learned specifically for, for the IF, uh, IFRC and uh, the ICRC um, for, for your supply chain after COVID-19? Do you feel that uh, humanitarian supply chains need to become more more localized than they were before, like uh, the commercial sector is currently discussing, something like this? One of the things that we have been discussing, and very early on, we have uh, a, a lot of back and forth within the organization and with the IFRC, with the Federation, in relation to local supply. So the, the purchasing of local supplies and, uh, and how some of the local supplies were not up to standards, so the quality of local supplies. And then we were met with a question and say, if a Ministry of Health in a given context is purchasing locally, why should not a humanitarian actor be able to purchase from the same supplier? But you have that kind of discussion at local level, and at the same time, you have the fact that as a humanitarian organization, you do have international standards to comply with. So you need to find a balance between local purchasing and then the humanitarian standards that you are applying. Now, to answer to your question, yes, I think we discovered very early on that we could manage some of our operations because we managed to buy regionally or locally. So the, the, even if there is no local production, the management on the stocking at regional level and at local level is quite important. Um, and then we saw the dependency we have on China and in India very early on. Uh, all of us were scrambling for where do we get the goods from? Uh, and even uh, many countries that are quite advanced in the health systems struggle with that. Now, I don't think this is a call to completely atomize the production because then the cost will increase. But there is a call really from a, from a procurement and the production point of view to see if it cannot be so heavily relying on one or two or three different actors. 
products or producers, because then we will run sooner or later into the same situation. So definitely we need to look at building the local capacity, but I'm not, uh, we are not discussing only the production of items, PPE in this case. And we have done, for example, and it can be done. We have, for example, mobilized some of our physical rehabilitation centers that employ people with disabilities and they were producing other goods. We switched them to produce uh, face shields and to produce uh, some of the personal protection equipment that was needed. Face shields we started to produce in our physical rehabilitation centers in Yemen very early on. So it's doable and some of that production, why should we need to import it if it can be produced locally and ideally involve some of the most um, at risk groups already people with disabilities, people that do have a way of generating income from this. So that's one called as humanitarian organizations. What can we do, do to boost um, the local communities through some production of this material? And the second one is really the capacity building element that not all the things need to come, all the, the management, for example, of warehouses, the management of a stock, the management of the logistics of transport in country. We and many organizations find our, found ourselves unable to do that with international staff. So really, and so the question is, have we trained and have we transferred and exchanged knowledge at local level in a way that the capacity is there to undertake these challenges? So let's hope that the next pandemic because this will not be the last one, will find us with as, as humanitarian actors really with a, a more efforts already in terms of capacity building at local level, logistics, health, and management in general, and even the production of PPE. So yes, it's a big lesson. We need to boost local capacity at, at many different levels. Thanks for the question. Cool, thank you. Thank you. And then we have another question here from Lila, um, also on supply chain. Uh, Lila, do you want to ask your question? I'm wondering if any of the disruptions that you faced in the supply chain during COVID ultimately affected uh, supplies down at service delivery point. Uh, was care and treatment affected or is there enough agility or um, slack in the supply chain and inventory to meet the demands of the clients? in the long run. Mm -hmm. I think we were, uh, we were, thank you for the question, Laila. I think we were lucky in the sense that the production in China started at the moment it did. Uh, if it had gone, if China will continue to be in lockdown and the factories continue to be closed, I don't think only the ICRC, but humanitarian organizations and ministries of health all over the world, we will have been in a much more dire situation. The fact that the, the, the number of cases started to decrease and the production started really eased some of the tensions in the supply and, the, and the, the mobilization of goods. What we found after the production was started was the fact that there were export restrictions in China. So that created a couple of months of, of, uh, of a strain on the supply chain. For the ICRC specifically, we basically uh, reactivated. We did a lot of moving of our, between our regional um, hubs and between our different um, a, a stocks. So we had a stocks that were sufficient to move uh, or to manage our operations at the beginning. But as I said, the replenishment, it was like giving birth to kittens here in Geneva, just looking at whether or not they the port or the export has been authorized, whether or not the paper had been signed at, at the Chinese level, for example. So it was really uh, a, a lot, a lot of work. Uh, we, we know that we have a strong logistics department, very organized and very uh, um, prepared in advance, but they really had to work very hard because of the changing nature of the, of the situation. It's not only the fact that factories were closed, but afterwards it was the negotiation for the export. We also engaged with some private uh, um, supplier transport companies to try to mobilize faster the goods. Uh, but they, again, they were also faced with the same uh, logistics and the same um, government hurdles that we all were faced. So at the end, yes, we were very thin on the ground at the end to be able to deliver, but we managed. But again, what I said at the beginning, we managed to do that because as an organization, we have 
we have a very strong logistics setup. Uh, for other organizations on the ground, they might not have been uh, as, as in a good position as we were because of the size. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, I'm going to ask um, one of our colleagues in the, uh, in the audience, Paul Molinaro from the World Health Organization, if he could perhaps um, reflect on some of what you have been talking about. Uh, there's so much uh, to, to consider, particularly on, in the current crisis, uh, the COVID crisis, I mean. Um, and I was just wondering, Paul, whether you would be willing to, to share your reflections. Uh, I know you've been extremely busy over the last few months and um, have been responsible for organizing uh, a, a lot of uh, the capability that's been used by organizations like uh, ICRC, uh, Federation of the Red Cross, or other or international organizations. What are the, some of the key challenges that you faced? Are you able um, to speak? Yeah, up, hi. Do you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Well, thanks for that last minute uh, invite. <laughs> <laughs> I was just happily listening away. I mean, I would, I mean, um, obviously, I thank, thanks for the, um, um, for the discussion and for the uh, presentation, Esperanza. And I mean, I would just back a lot of what was said uh, by Esperanza. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's true. Um, now, we, of course, collectively all face the same challenges. Certainly the issue with a lack of harmonized PPE standards um, early on was difficult. I know that's a project um, some of the technical units are, are looking at going, going forward. Um, we were quite surprised um, in PP by how concentrated the manufacturing was, um, particularly in China. Um, and as the um, export restrictions spread to um, other parts of the world and other countries were sort of requisitioning and acting um, not necessarily with uh, enlightened uh, self-interest um, that we saw um, a great kind of bottleneck developing. Um, and even the way that modern supply chains were structured, I think, took a lot of people by surprise in, in, in terms of how dependent companies were on a single manufacturing place, even when outsourcing um, to a second party who outsourced to a third party um, with production ending up in China. Um, and we saw this uh, on several occasions where some companies weren't necessarily aware that that's where their production was. Our earlier estimates were sort of around 50% of production um, there. We sort of finally ended up on, you know, anywhere between 60 and 80%. Um, and so that's been difficult. We did make some um, effort. We um, continuously reviewed the standards and, and published the disease commodity packages. Obviously, if you've got a huge volume issue where, we, where demand is vastly outstripping supply. Um, we did um, set up the uh, independent technical review group who did um, accept uh, the Chinese KN95 KN um, when we're talking on respirators. Um, and that sort of opens the door to uh, be able to negotiate with some uh, ministries of health on their acceptance um, of those standards. Um, now on, 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 on PPE, when it comes to, and again, the question of local procurement, I, you know, thoroughly support what uh, Esperanza has said in terms of that balance between um, the quality assurance uh, uh, element um, and the uh, benefits of local production. And, and sometimes, I mean, we talking with medical devices, I mean, obviously there are certain standards, um, particularly with some of the items that, that have to be adhered to. I think in a long-term project, I mean, it's certainly something, and I think Suvi had mentioned it yesterday, UNICEF's effort with ready to use therapeutic food, looking longer term to be able to develop that kind of investment for that kind of production. Certainly also in other devices coming up when we're talking, when we're looking at vaccine, um, like syringes, like safety boxes, um, where I think the time to act, to act is now when it comes to diversifying um, those markets because the demand for that, in addition to the vaccine and, and fridges and, and other things is gonna be enormous. Um, so certainly um, on that, 
thoroughly agree. Now, at the end of the day, the PPE is not necessarily humongously complex other than gloves, um, which is set up a production facility can take around 12 to 14 months. Um, but the rest should be fairly quick. And the market did respond. Um, and certainly those tightness we felt in the market is not necessarily being uh, felt at the moment. Um, now, when it comes to something like diagnostics, where <laughs> it's something that didn't exist um, in January, um, uh, the optimistic part of this is the way uh, science and industry has been able to respond. And within four weeks, um, notwithstanding the fact that it's an unknown virus on December the 31st, the genetic sequence identified first week of January, genetic sequence shared second week of January, genetic sequence put into labs for, um, for tests to be developed, um, independent verification of some of those essays coming out, finally contracting with a vendor and starting to ship out by 5th of February, I think is enormous achievement um, uh, that the global community um, has managed. And we see that going forward, certainly um, on manual PCR tests with five or six companies now on the emergency use listing, um, that that market is less constrained. We are obviously going to move into a new um, era when it comes to um, rapid diagnostic antigen tests. We do have one on the EUL, but again, that will be severely constrained. So in, in each of these kind of product market segments, the approaches need to be completely different and will generate their own, their own issues. Um, I think where it becomes critical um, in having three-level alignment is, is in the complexity around something like oxygen provision, um, which is certainly so dependent on how the facility is structured, the piping they have, um, the skilled uh, clinicians, uh, technical or machine operators for ventilators, um, and certainly there you'll, you see a, a potential uh, capacity gap. And, and, and that's something we've seen even in um, industrialized countries, the large facilities being put in, in, into place by the military, lots of ventilators, but not enough ICU clinicians or nurses to run it. Um, so it's a big challenge that we are going to collectively face. Um, I think in, in vaccines, the approach is right with the ACT Accelerator, the COVAX facility, an attempt to try and reduce national self-interest and move a lot more to enlighten self-interest. And really that's to try and push the understanding that um, acting alone in this doesn't work. Um, and that requisitioning, uh, stopping export from one country can actually backfire on the country doing that. I think that lesson has been learned from the last eight months, certainly going forward um, yeah. into the yeah, into the bigger picture. With the yeah, thanks, thanks, Paul. There, I mean, that huge in that amount to, of, of uh, stuff that's been done. Really, really, really uh, impressive. What's been achieved. Um, still, many challenges. I just wanted to allow a final word to Esperanza. I think she wanted to ask you a question, actually. Yes, thank you so much. And Paul, I just very want to revert to you with a question that was posed to me in relation to. What about the, this fragility of our health, public health, um, global public health system in relation to the supply chain and the fact that we have concentration of production of certain items in one or two contexts? Uh, we, on one hand, uh, that demonstrated that makes us as the world very fragile, particularly to respond to humanitarian emergencies. On the other hand, there is no spirit and, and promotion of nationalism. And we are having this conversation in relation to vaccine. So we need this global environment, but at the same time, we cannot fall prey again to having one or two single production sites that if they are blocked by a virus, then we are all going to face challenges. So where do we see the cursor from a WHO perspective um, in, in this kind of production of essential supplies moving forward? Oh, a nice, easy one. Um, one minute to respond. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, you, you're, you're completely right. I think the global fragility is, is, is all supply chain. It's not just the, the health uh, one. Um, I think this has been uh, a, a, a time to pause and take stock um, in how um, industrial supply chains are set up in manufacturing across the board, um, including where we got um, uh, extreme difficulties with uh, raw material. I mean, latex production in Malaysia and the knock-on that has a, a, a across PPE. Um, 
and and I think that's a, a I think this is I think something a theme that's going to keep popping up uh, over the remaining part of this uh, um, of this conference. Now, how can you diversify? Um, I, obviously, it needs uh, close collaboration with inve with investment um, and the risk of that investment. Um, from the WHO side, all we can really do is in, is in terms of setting the standard um, and uh, trying to uh, mobilize around forecasts so that um, industry has an idea of potentially the market that we're talking about. And don't forget, PPE was a kind of static market for a long period of time. There is a spike now, um, but how long that spike will, at what point will new entrants not wish to engage because they don't see longevity in it. I don't see that that's going to be the case in something like vaccine or therapeutics or to a degree diagnostics. Um, and if you look at, um, back um, at some of the work Gavi did, advanced market commitments um, in uh, a pneumococcal vaccine, it may start with one or two industrialized uh, uh, economies. But then certainly as more knowledge is acquired um, and as there is more comfort with the size of the market, I think the market will then make its adjustments and you'll start to see production in places like Indonesia, in places like Southeast Asia, in India uh, and in, in, other, in other countries. That diversifies, it brings the price down, it brings more availability. Now, obviously within that, the chances again is certain economies and environments being left out, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and there you're looking at, well, the level of investment there for some of these facilities is going to be quite, um, quite um, a, a large question. But at the end of the day, if this happens again, we're going to have to have geographic diversity in, in, in the sources of manufacturing. It's easy to say. I think it's very hard to deliver in practice because there's so much of a financial and economic question around it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. No, I mean, great, great points. Um, Dr. Martinez uh, Esperanza, thank you very much for your keynote address. And uh, thank you, Paul. Sorry to pick on you. And um, there's lots to talk about. <laughs> but no, it's really, really good stuff. Um, thank you very much for the I invitation. Think... And, and apologies for the video, but these kind of things happen. So <laughs> Yes, indeed. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Jocelyn. Uh, we're out of time, sadly. Uh, in fact, we've run over. <laughs> so, uh, Jocelyn, back to you to, to pick up.